computer. Okay. I think I'm, I think I am uh, recording now. All right, before we get to the opening school year packet, which is mandatory for all employees, um, I want to welcome some new team members uh, to the staff. Um, we introduced her to the teachers yesterday, but please welcome Stephanie Quay in grade one. There's the lay. Turn around. There you go. All right. Uh, he's not here. Uh, he will be uh, soon, hopefully, our music teacher, Benjamin Perry. We can give him a round of applause. Uh, our Makua, uh, Makua Puamana, is here in the house. Welcome. Um, hopefully, this person shows up today. Uh, she's supposed to report to us, even though she's been in training. Uh, our SHSS, basically the person who's going to deal with all the COVID stuff. Uh, we have her for a year. Her name is Catherine Cam. Let's give her a round of applause too. Um, and then lastly, uh, our, our other EA who's also in the hiring process, uh, Sonomi Villatoro, when she gets processed, then she will be here and you guys can welcome her, but at least you'll know her name. And then we'll also welcome back uh, again, Christy Nakagawara. Yay! And then for those of you who weren't here yesterday, you're like, why are we welcoming back Andrew and Christina? Because they've been here. The difference is now they're tenure teachers. So they've earned their tenure and passed their co-teachers. Kind of a different category and some a kind of a milestone in teaching when you get your tenure. Okay, so I'm gonna start off with some, some things about my beliefs and I, and I want to impart this. I think I do this every year. Uh, to you guys so you know where I'm coming from uh, with things. And so the first thing is that every child wants to and is capable of learning. We just need to find the key to make it happen. Okay, I truly believe that. Um, that's the reason why we have this job. We want to work with kids. We want to make them better. We want to see them uh, progress. It's embedded in our vision and mission and our belief statements uh, as a school. Um, and just so you know, that's, that's really where I'm, I'm coming from as an administrator and one of the, the biggest reasons I got into education. Um, with that said, academics are just as important as developing good people, right? The world is crazy now. There's all kinds of people out there. Nobody ever talks about how smart you are. They talk about how good of a person you are, you know? Um, and I've been at the high school level, um, and really a lot of those uh, bad habits that we see are developed young, right? And so it's incumbent on us to kind of help guide uh, our kiddos uh, to be those good people uh, through the social emotional learning that live aloha, you know, the compassion, the growth mindset, all those kind of good things. Um, and that's just important as um, our test scores, you know, we are known for those things that we, we really score highly on state tests, but I think you'll notice that I hardly ever talk about those things. And I talk way more about our SEL and caring for kids, having a kind campus and those kinds of things. Cause I think that's way more important. Okay. The academics will come. You guys are all talented uh, individuals that add value to our campus from even the custodial staff and the cafeteria staff and office staff who support us uh, to the the EAs and the PTTs and the PPTs and everybody, you know, we all have a part of developing all of these kids, right? Um, and checking them when they're not doing the right thing. So they're all of our kids, yeah? Third, we have to be in it for the long haul, right? We can't give up on people. We got to be here for the kids. So if the kid is not performing, uh, you know, in the beginning of the year, we got to have faith and keep at it. We can't give up on people. And that, be, that starts with building relationships, right? We build a relationship with the individuals here. Um, you know, it's hard to, to give up on people and just say, ah, this, this kid can't learn. Um, so have the mindset that we're in it for the long haul. 
we got them from sometimes from when they're three years old all the way up. And I mentioned this already, but these are all of our students and we're all in this together, including the non uh, teaching staff. Yeah, you guys are important in recognizing things that if kids aren't, aren't doing the right thing, that uh, you guys are more than welcome to step in and, and say something. And the last thing is we need to know why we're here, right? We've done this exercise every single year, uh, but I think it's important. I think it's important to, to kind of get back to the reason why, uh, not only in education, but why we're at Noilani Elementary School, right? So we're gonna do a quick exercise. I want you to take a few minutes, maybe five would be too much because some of you have already done this, but if you can take a piece of paper or maybe just in your head, Figure out the why, why you work here at Noilani Elementary School. Take a few minutes. The reason we do this is when times are tough and you're like, to heck with this, you bring out that piece of paper and you read it. And hopefully it'll energize you to keep going. And hopefully you're not saying it's because the paycheck, because it's not really that great. Some of you teachers might still have your why in your desk drawer. That's good. I know some of you do. Okay, maybe take another 30 seconds and then we're going to move on. All right, I wanna talk a little bit about our goals for this school year as a, as a school. You might have individual goals that you wanna accomplish, but I wanna set forth some goals that we can all work towards uh, for this school year. So the first one I kind of mentioned, I mentioned it a lot, is to connect with our students, but make sure we do that very early on in the school year, from day one. Let's try and connect with our kids. Um, I know I try to learn all the kids' names. That's like kind of a baseline. Um, thing, uh, but get to know at least one, one thing that they're interested in, right? So you can talk story with them. Um, I think I mentioned to the teachers yesterday, uh, one of the conferences that I had to go to this summer, unfortunately, was, be was a result of all the school shootings that have been happening and what we can kind of do about it. And a lot of it had to do with building relationships with kids and knowing when something is going on that they're kind of out of whack. Yeah. Even the quiet ones, yeah, that don't really like to talk, the introverted kids. Um, we still got to talk story with them, kind of get to know them, know when something is going on. Again, making kindness a priority in, which is the easy part, but the harder part is outside the classroom. And that's where we all got to come in. So when we see kids at recess, they may not be our grade level. You might not be a teacher. Hey, whatever. Kids are doing wrong. We got to address it but do it with kindness and teach them, not just scold them, teach them what they did wrong and how they can do better in the future. Close the gap. So this is more of an academic goal. Um, the gap for those of you who are not teachers is the difference between the kids who are non-high needs, who basically are not English language learners, special education, or disadvantaged, disadvantaged are like homeless or they're on free reduced lunch, stuff like that. They have something going on in their lives that will put a, a speed bump in their way, right? So the gap is the difference between the kids who don't have those speed bumps and the kids who do. And we wanna close that gap as much as possible. And that's our goal is to at least get it into 
the single digits. Uh, right now we're in the double digits. Um, and part of that is because of COVID, but we should always be striving to, to help all of our kids and to bring the bottom up to the top as well. And lastly, I think it's the last one, is to take time for yourself. I asked the teachers yesterday, and for those of you who are custodial and CAF and everybody else who came in, do you guys take time for yourself every day? At least 15 minutes. Truly, do you do that? And it's not like, oh, I go and clean. Yeah. Something like, are you exercising? Do you kind of just meditate? You know, somebody, when we did our conference said, oh, I water the grass. That's like soothing for me. But do you take that time for yourself? A lot of us have families. Yeah. And you do a lot of things for the family, but are you taking that time for yourself? It's important. So please make sure you do that. We all work hard and we need that time to decompress. Oh, and then the last one was remember your what? Okay. All right, you got to pack it. You got to sign five of those things. So try check that you make sure you have. The, the first one is that group sign in that you did at the front that acknowledged that you got the opening school year packet. Okay. The second one is the opening of school year packet acknowledgement form, which you should have in front of you. You got that? Make sure you sign it. There's some, um, what do you call it? Trays in the back. You can put your papers in after you sign it today. Make sure you date it too if it says the date. And today is the 27th. You have the opening of school year video viewing confirmation form that you that you're uh, acknowledging that you watched all the videos. Make sure you sign that one. You got the general confidentiality expectations. You might have to turn the paper over and the signing is like a, a little bit of a thing on the top of the, the second page, the back side of the page. So you make sure you just turn that whole paper in when you power with that. And then the last thing is the adult publication video, audio video release form. Whether you want, you do or don't want your image to be used in audio or video or whatever, what else? It's up to you, I don't care. And then you have two reference, um, you have two references. Uh, one is the employee assistance program. So if you need, a, you need help with stuff, uh, there's a lot of resources that you can tap and I do believe they are free. Um, and then there is a sheet that has all the policies. That's just for your reference. That goes along with the opening school year packet. We good? You guys get, if you're missing one, then go in the back and go grab it. But you got to sign the four sheets that you got you already, and sign the one, sign in back there. So there's actually two sign-ins now. You have to sign in two places. One that you attended this meeting and one that you acknowledge that you got the opening school year packet thing. Okay, is everybody straight? Any questions on that? Okay, get that out of the way. Hey, what's going on? Hey, what's going on? Okay, here we go. Uh, for those of you who were not here yesterday, um, if you walked in, you saw the sign that said, masks are optional. That's part of the new safety protocols. Um, it's a lot more open now. Um, there are still some restrictions on things. Um, and that depends, the kind of little bit more restrictions is based off the CDC transmission rate, whether it's medium or high. So right now, according to the CDC, we're in a high transmission rate for Honolulu. Okay, so for the first quarter, we're going to follow this schedule. Um, so those of you who are, are doing specials, you need to see Kim uh, for the slightly, it's slightly adjusted special schedule, but your start and end times remain the same, but the class stuff in between changed. Okay, so this basically affects, we're going back to the 9.45 to 10 o'clock recess. Last year was 9.30 to 9.50. But we'll go back to 9.45 to 10. And then lunch will be a rolling lunch. 
for every 15 minutes, a new grade level goes into the cafeteria. And then we just switch the different areas. Um, this is what new Wanu does because their cafeteria is so small, they cannot fit a lot of kids in there. So I've seen it happen. Um, it's a little bit calmer in there because only got really two grade levels at a time. Um, all the kids will sit on one side of the table but there'll be space. They cannot be like right up next to each other. They'll be kind of like you guys, maybe just a few feet apart. Okay. I will do this for the first quarter, as I said. And then everybody finishes at 2.15, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and 1.30 on Wednesdays. So if, if the transmission rate goes down, then we'll adjust our lunch schedule in the second quarter and go back to basically what we used to do in the pre-pandemic. Okay. So just so everybody knows what's up. Open house. So yesterday, teachers, uh, I got feedback from you, thought about it overnight. So this is what we're going to do. It's going to have the parents report directly to your class at 545, by 545. And I'll put out that we want one parent preferred, no students, and masks are highly encouraged. Okay. Stanford Togashi, who's the PTA president and myself, will just broadcast out of here. Uh, so you guys will put on, I'll send you the link and you'll just put us on and then we'll go from 545 to 615. Then since they're in your class, there's no transition time. 615 to 635, you guys do your deal. 640 to seven o'clock, second session, and then we're out. So that shaves off 20 minutes basically from the, what we would have done in the open house. Uh, fourth grade, if you guys want to, have your parents spread out and meet in the CAF and you broadcast it out of there. That's up to you. And then you guys can do your meeting out of there. Then you guys, I didn't want to do it. Then you guys have the space. Yeah. You guys can just take that space. Okay. So I'll put this out to parents. Um, today, tomorrow, something like that. Um, and then you guys can follow up with whatever. Okay. All right, here we go. Let's get into the meat of this thing. And I know some of you have been doing this for fill in the blank how many years you've been in the department. It's pretty much hasn't changed. Some of the videos have been updated. Some of them have not. Some of them are super entertaining because they are super old and they have bad actors. Um, but this is mandatory for all employees. So the people who are not here, who are in your section or division or grade levels or whatever will still need to go and, and do this. That's why I'm recording it. Uh, right now, and I'm actually broadcasting it because Kim can't leave the office, so it kind of works out that I can do this on Zoom. Uh, so they can just jump on and watch this entire, I don't know how many hour long video. Um, so this covers some, but not all of the information you need to know. I gave you some of the policies from the D, uh, Board of Education. So just so you know, Board of Education makes policy, Department of Education makes rules and guidelines, right? So the department doesn't necessarily create policy. So we take what the board says is the policy and then we detail it out. Um, you should have got an electronic copy of the opening school year packet in your DOE Gmail, not the Noilani one now, the DOE Gmail. If you don't know your uh, user, which is your employee ID number um, at k12.hi.us and your password, um, go see Casey. Um, everyone should have access to the weekly bulletin. If you don't, you need to let me know. Um, and in there, there's a link to the agenda for today. And through the agenda, you can get to this slideshow. Okay. So you can always refer back to anything that I talk about today. Um, and I'm available to review any part of this packet with you uh, at any time if you guys have any questions. Okay, if you had the actual uh, opening school year packet, if you printed it out, I'm going to refer to all the page numbers. I don't think you guys care, um, but I put it on there anyway. So in case you refer back to this, you can see what page I refer to. Um, so you'll see the page numbers on there. That's what I'm talking about. It's, you know, it's this book, and then I'm going by each page number correlates to a slide. So just so you know, as future reference. Okay, so on page one, there's an annual memo. Uh, that 
you are required to follow all BOE policies as well as DOE procedures, regulations, guidelines, and profiles on the DOE intranet. Failure to follow may subject you to disciplinary action. Um, and then it also mentions that the teacher, uh, teachers have a different uh, section for them only in the back of the pack packet, which we went over yesterday. Okay, the next thing is scope of duties. So there's three things that they sort of uh, point out in the scope of duties. Uh, one is corporal punishment that no physical punishment of any kind may be inflicted upon any pupil with the exception that reasonable force may be used to restrain a student from hurting him or herself or any other person or property, right? So we shouldn't be touching kids, especially if we are upset with them, right? So the thing I talked to teachers about yesterday was there's a, um, what do we call it? Something of force there. Uh, it's like a range of force. So the number one and number two uh, things on there would be your command presence, just being there to stop misbehavior. And second would be to use your voice, right? The next thing after that is light touching. But once we start into touching, you need to be very, very careful. Okay. Uh, secondly, is strip searches. Um, no DOE employee is authorized to conduct a strip search of a student, not even me. Um, I wouldn't do that anyway. And the last thing, um, as much as you might laugh and shake your head or whatever, uh, DOE employees or volunteers shall not engage in any romantic or sexual and or inappropriate relations with a student or students. Okay, just be careful. Um, we used to tell this to the high school teachers, uh, but it can apply for every level. Yeah, because there have been elementary teachers, you know, staff, whoever that have gotten into trouble for this as well. Be careful what you do on social media. Yeah, you may think, oh, I'm just gonna friend all my students and this and that. Be super careful. Know where the line is, okay? And I hate to have to be the one to say it, but that's just how it is nowadays, okay? So inappropriate conduct includes, but is not limited to verbal expressions, inappropriate physical contact and or inappropriate communications. Uh, and then they just mentioned in the final paragraph that the conduct is not only restricted to the above, any violation of BOE policies or DOE procedures and regulations will not be tolerated and can lead to termination. So that leads into our code of conduct video. First video of the day. The volume. Purpose of code conduct is to assess behavior of conduct for all of the students in the line department. The charter will be used throughout the studio and send single students for the full time staff and the department employees, as well as contractors and volunteers. These individuals play a balanced role with potential students. He's got the remote now. It is a policy, the Board of Education, there we go. that all employees have to protect themselves in an ethical yeah. manner and comply with federal and state laws, rules, regulations, and departmental policies for both public trust, confidence, and public education. All employees should maintain high standards of honesty, integrity, and impartiality. Employees should conduct themselves in a manner that promotes and supports the development of good character by teaching, enforcing, advocating, and modeling ethical principles and values. Employees shall not use their official position for personal gain, preferential treatment, or confidential information for personal advantage. 
All employees are expected to conduct themselves professionally, as well as to serve as profitable models from students, parents, and the community. The DOE expects all employees to adhere to the standards of ethical conduct. The scenarios shown in this video are based on real events and represent some, but not all, examples of code of conduct violations. DOE employees should practice the professional standards of federal, state, and local governing bodies. Any act in deliberate disregard of these standards in the course of the following practices shall be prohibited. Serve as a positive role model for students, parents, and the community. Assessment, treatment, instruction, or supervision of students. Employment or evaluation of personnel and management of funds and property. A school won't mind if I borrow a little money from them to pay tax money. I can't pay it back once every time from day yet. Employees should maintain honesty in all professional deals. You should not be any form of dishonesty, qualification, exception, representation, or fee. Or false. An employee makes the meaning comments about and to the teacher, and he gets others in the school to do the same. This is considered bullying. True, this is considered bullying behavior will not be allowed. Bullying is defined as inappropriate behavior, either direct or indirect, verbal, physical, or psychological, conducted by one or more person repeated over time. A one time incident of inappropriate behavior may not be considered bullying, but it is subject to corrective action. Your students are being really good today. They should be. I just have to remind them how stupid they are. The DOE is committed to providing a theory environment conducive to the physical, mental, social, and emotional well being of students while participating in school activities. Therefore, employees who interact with students should maintain appropriate teacher student and adult child relationships. This includes avoiding acts of sexual exploitation, using inappropriate language that is considered profane, vulgar, or demeaning with to or the presence of a student. No physical punishment may be inflicted upon any student. Reasonable force can only be used to restrain a student from hurting himself or herself or any other person or property. Hey, Coach, I'm excited about the fun of you. You're working with me after practice is really paying off. I'm excited too. You put in the work and it shows. When I should go out to dinner after the game, you just the two of us. DOE employees do not commit any abuse of act or sexual exploitation with, to, or in the persons of a student. This includes any intentional solicitation, encouragement, or consummation of a romantic or physical relationship with a student. Do a pause. It's okay to lose your frustrations and slumping your fists into the ball every once in a while. False. Workplace violence will not be tolerated. This includes acts involving physical attack, property damage, and verbal statements that can be perceived as suggesting an intent to harm another person. This is perfect. My daughter needs a job and I need to hire a new clerk. The DOE's hiring and personnel decisions will be fair and objective. Due to the potential for perceived or multiple conflicts, employees are restricted from having a supervisor. Immediate family members. This is defined as parent, child, grandparent, grandchild, brother, sister, husband, wife, partner, or cohabitating couples. Any exceptions to this code must be in writing from the superintendent or designee prior to personal life. Refer to the D.7 form under the resource tab. Further information concerning ethics may be found on the Hawaiian State Ethics Commission website. A link to their site can be found under the resource tab. True or false, a supervisor shall not punish an individual who reports actions believed to be inappropriate under the code. True, an employee shall not threaten, harass, punish, or discriminate against anyone that in good faith reports, discloses, or divulges any practices believed to be inappropriate under the code or in violation of policies, procedures, or laws. Thanks for coming in for the interview today. Thanks for having me. I love working with kids. 
we've been looking to hire an aging girl for the office. Ooh. DOE employees do not discriminate or harass a person because of his or her race, sex, including gender identity or expression, sexual orientation, age, religion, ancestry, national origin, disability, marital status, arrest and court records, domestic and sexual violence and victim status, income assignment from child support, National Guard absence, breastfeeding, citizenship status, veteran status, or any other basis protected by federal or state law. True or false, it is okay to look at dating websites on your work computer while at school. False, employees should limit access to the internet connection and use of DOE technology to business transaction and business communication necessary to conduct their duties. DOE networks, internet connections shall be used in accordance with the DOE acceptable user guidelines and procedure. Looking at inappropriate material, such as pornography, sending inappropriate messages and pictures, including nudity, sexting, and emails and text messages of a sexual nature is prohibited. That student just told me his mom did say, what should I do? All DOE employees must make all reports required by law with DOE policies and procedures related to reporting of child abuse and neglect. Employees shall report any practices or actions believed to be inappropriate under this code or any legal person to the supervisor, manager, contracting officer, or to the DOE law and ethics hotline. To make a confidential report, please contact the DOE law and ethics hotline. 855-233-8085 or visit www.reportlineweb.com forward slash hypo. This video was an overview of the code of conduct. As mentioned in the beginning of this presentation, you can find a link to the entire code of conduct by clicking on the resource tab in the top right-hand corner of this presentation or a copy in the opening of school year packet for your review. In the interest of the job and for the benefit of our kids, it is your responsibility to know the code. Any questions on the video? All good. Shoots, you know the code. All right. Okay, so just to reiterate, the actual code of conduct is available in the opening school year packet for your review. Uh, some of the guiding principles would be employees, contractors, volunteers shall maintain high standards of honesty, integrity, and impartiality. The educational and uh, educational and developmental interests of students shall be a priority for employees, contractors, and volunteers. Employees, contractors, and volunteers should conduct themselves in a manner that promotes and supports the development of good character by teaching, enforcing, advocating, and modeling ethical principles and values. And employees, contractors, volunteers shall not use or attempt to use their official position for personal gain, preferential treatment, or confidential information for personal advantage. So please do not try to sell your online business to your parents or whatever. So, okay. Any questions about that? I would say this is not necessarily common sense, but good sense. If you have a question at any time about something or something that somebody else is doing, please see me. Okay. All right. Page 10 uh, in the handbook talks about uh, restraints and seclusion. So pursuant to HRS, the uh, purpose of the restraint and seclusion law is to protect students from physical and mental abuse. Um, aversive behavioral interventions that compromise health and safety and any restraint imposed solely for the purpose of discipline or convenience. So there is a video about this. So here we go. Another video. To this presentation on the restraint and seclusion guidelines for the 
This presentation is an introduction to the provisions of the use and description of restraints and seclusion in Hawaii public schools. In recent years, the use of restraint and seclusion in education has become an issue of national significance. Injuries and deaths associated with the ongoing use of restraint and seclusion in school settings have come to the attention of the public with concerns that some of these procedures violate basic human rights. In May 2009, Reports of alleged abuse and deaths related to restraint and seclusion methods in schools across the U.S. triggered congressional hearings. Hundreds of cases were reviewed in which adult restrained students inappropriately putting students at unnecessary risk of injury or even death. Some examples cited include reports of being taped or behind chairs, hidden sports for hours, or locked in closets. The U.S. Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pension Committee could not find any evidence that K-12 students benefited from seclusion or physical restraint. As a result of these congressional hearings, the U.S. Department of Education published several documents to address concerns. One of these documents, U.S. DOE Restraint and Seclusion Resource Document, identifies 15 principles that they believe state, local schools, parents, and other stakeholders should consider in developing and implementing restraint and seclusion policies. These five statements summarize the guiding principles which are reflected in Hawaii's law. Every effort to prevent use of restraint. Never use mechanical restraint to restrict students. Physical restraint only in imminent danger. Policies on seclusion and restraint apply to all children. Behavioral intervention consistent with child dignity and free from abuse. On July 2nd, 2014, the governor signed into law House Bill 1796 relating to the use of restraints and seclusion for students in Hawaii public schools. This law, now Hawaii Revised Statutes 302A-1141, 302A-1141.3, and 302A-1141.4, became effective for Hawaii public schools on August 1st, 2016. This law prohibits the use of seclusion, mechanical restraint and chemical restraint, regardless of any consent of the student, parents, or guardian. It also establishes the conditions for the use of physical restraint. This law mandates training in the area of positive behavioral interventions and supports to reduce the need for physical intervention and outlines the data collection and reporting requirements. This law applies to all public schools and all students in the Hawaii Department of Education. The overall purpose of this law is to ensure the safety and well-being of all students and personnel in public schools, while promoting a positive school climate and culture. This law protects all students from physical and mental abuse and prevents the use of aversive behavioral interventions, such as the use of noxious odors or tape, blast of air, corporal punishment, forced exercise, denial of food or water, or using medication to eliminate or discourage undesirable behavior. It also exclusively prevents the use of restraint as a form of punishment or for convenience. There are three types of restraint defined by Hawaii Revised Statutes 302A-1141.4. Mechanical, chemical, and physical. Hawaii law does not permit the use of mechanical or chemical restraints under any circumstance. Chemical restraint is not meant to be interpreted as a medication prescribed by a licensed physician or other qualified professional acting under the scope of their authority under state law for the standard treatment of a student's medical or psychiatric condition. Likewise, mechanical restraint is not meant to include assistive technology or orthopedic support prescribed by a medical professional to allow a student with a disability access to the curriculum or participation in educational activities. Historically, restraints have been used as punishment for undesirable behaviors across the country. Under Hawaii law, this is not permitted. Restraints are never to be used for teaching or punishing behavior. Physical restraint may only be used when certain conditions are satisfied. A physical restraint is defined as a personal restriction that immobilizes or reduces the ability of the student to move the student's arms, legs, or head freely. The conditions that must be met for a restraint to be allowable are a student's actions pose a clear, present, and imminent physical danger to himself or herself or others or substantial property damage, and 
less restrictive measures have failed or have been deemed ineffective. Restraints should only be imposed by staff who are trained and certified in how to prevent restraints and how to perform restraints safely when necessary. The restraint should last only as long as necessary to resolve the danger and the degree of force applied may not exceed what is necessary to protect the student or other person from eminent bodily injury or substantial property damage. Now, Ms. Ritchie, a physical restraint is not a teaching procedure, not a behavioral intervention, and it is not used for non-compliance, disrespect, or disobedience, except as provided under Hawaii state law. Section 703-309, paragraph 2. A physical restraint is a safe, non-harmful procedure used to prevent a student from behaviors that pose an imminent danger of self-harm, harm to others, or substantial property damage. Here are what these prohibited practices based on the Hawaii Revised Statute, Section 302A-1141.3, also referred to as Act 206, of 2014, or House Bill 1796 of 2014. The use of seclusion, mechanical or chemical restraints are prohibited practices, regardless of any consent of the student, parents, or guardians. Students may not be locked in a room unsupervised for any length of time. Mechanical restraints, such as the use of tape or ropes, should never be used on students in the school setting. Assistive technology devices may be used in school settings, but only if they are for the purpose of providing access to the curriculum or to allow them to participate in educational activities. These devices must comply with IDEA and may not be used for punishment or convenience. These devices should only be used in the home and with a order by a physician, occupational therapist, or physical therapist, and must be included in the student's individualized education program. Medications may never be used by schools to manage or address student behavior. Sometimes there is confusion between the use of a seclusion room and the behavioral management technique called timeout. Timeout is a behavioral management technique used to interrupt unacceptable behavior. A student, as a result of his misbehaviors, needs a place to safely de escalate and to regain control of him or herself so that he or she can be prepared to return to class engaged and attentive. Timeout may also be used in conjunction with a behavioral support plan developed to teach and reinforce appropriate behaviors. A timeout area is a supervised location monitored by school staff. It is not a locked, isolated room. Immediately following a physical restraint being imposed on a student, the incident must be documented in Infinite Campus, the department's key information system under the Custom Restraints Camp. This tab is only available to school administrators or designees. Also required following an incident is written notification to parents or legal guardians. Written notice must be sent via registered mail or hand delivered within 24 hours of the incident. Here is a sample of the current written parent notification form that will be generated from Infinite Campus once the incident information is entered. Following the restraint incident, a staff debriefing can occur as soon as it is practical to do so. The focus of the debriefing should be on identifying the triggers and staff responses. The debriefing should include all participants of the restraint situation and the administrator. Because the debriefing is for internal quality assurances and reflective learning for staff, it may not be appropriate to include stakeholders who were not directly involved in the incident. A separate post incident meeting should be conducted with the student. If any student is restrained repeatedly in a school year, it is important for a multidisciplinary team to meet to address the needs of the individual student. This meeting provides an opportunity for schools to customize a holistic, proactive approach for the student concern. This meeting must include the parent and, if appropriate, the student. The team should review all available data, parent input, and student input before considering which interventions may be needed, if appropriate. A functional behavior assessment may be conducted and a behavior support plan developed. The discussion at the debriefing should focus on the conditions that triggered the incident, alternate interventions that were used, and why they weren't successful in de escalating the situation. The team should look for patterns and discuss environmental factors, review how the situation is found, and identify interventions for future events so that restraints may be avoided. 
Let's summarize the responsibilities of school, conflict areas, and the state office. Upon a student's entry into school, written information about restraint and seclusion policies will be provided to students and families. All schools need to maintain records of physical restraint use. Due to physical restraint use, the school will provide written notification to parents or legal guardians within 24 hours, along with a copy of the parent information brochure. Complex areas need to establish a contrary claim who will be certified and recertified annually in crisis intervention. These complex area conflicts will provide training and support to their respective schools. Annually, all complex areas will submit a report to the Office of Student Support Services on the use of physical restraints. The DOE will then conduct a statewide review of the physical restraint data from all schools, examining patterns and trends. The DOE is responsible for updating policies and guidelines as required to ensure alignment with Hawaii laws. Throughout the year, the department will continue to coordinate and provide statewide training to all complex areas. In summary, when dealing with student behavioral challenges, the department firmly believes that all students are more likely to achieve and perform better when staff procedures emphasize prevention and proactive support. Research shows that the use of positive behavior intervention and supports reduce the need for restraint. All teachers should create a positive environment where students are explicitly taught school wide behavioral expectations and classroom routines. Remember to reinforce positive behaviors with praise and recognition and avoid reinforcing challenging behaviors. Mahalo to all for keeping our children safe. Should you need further information, please visit our community homepage. Okie dokie. So I've only had to do this a couple times uh, where I had to enter into Infinite Campus. So I'll just let you know it asks for what technique did you use? And basically, that technique is based off of if you got QBS training. And so if you don't have QBS training, shouldn't be restraining kids unless it's something that, you know, they're going to harm themselves. If they're harming property, we can always fix it. We're trying to kick a hole in the wall. Like we had a student who used to like to do that. We can always fix the drywall. But if they're going to bang their head into the wall and you need to do something, yeah, um, you can do something to, to prevent themselves from harming themselves or even harming others. But don't like, ooh, if you're all jacked up and you're kind of, you know, got the adrenaline, adrenaline flowing, understand that you're doing it to stop it and then you need to release it. If they start walking around, let them walk. Yeah, just prevent them from not going off campus. Call for help. We can all come out. We used to sheep dogging kids around and just following them and mirroring them how they walk. And sometimes they just need some time to like let all of that get out of the red and come down, you know, give them some water and then they can kind of get back into their logical brain instead of the more emotional lizard kind of brain. Yeah. So any questions on that? Okay, I'm going to take a quick break. And if you guys can look to the back of the room, uh, Catherine, who actually goes more by Emma Lani, our SHSS has just arrived. So if you guys can welcome her, welcome. <clears throat> She's actually going to uh, go back to the office and start doing uh, some health kind of stuff for us. So I just wanted to make sure to introduce, you guys can individually go up to her later and introduce yourselves so she can get to know everybody. But welcome, welcome Emilani. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Chris. Okay. It's all good. I asked if she wanted to eat and she said, yep. <laughs> I like that. Okay, so there are a couple of policies, like I said, Board of Ed policy, and then we do all the stuff, right? DOE created the video and the I Infinite Campus stuff and the trainings and all that. So there is a policy, it's 305-1, that basically says the Department of Education shall provide a caring environment conducive to the physical, mental, social, and emotional well-being of students while they are participating in school activities. So that's where it comes from, yeah? So they wanna give you guys, like, it's not just coming out of thin air, there is actually a basis for the things that are happening in the Department of Education. Um, this is just from me, just some student safety kind of stuff. 
Um, closed doors, avoid being alone with the student in any kind of space, especially if you're, you know, you're closing the door. Um, we used to use AC, so this was a relic of pre-pandemic. Hopefully we can bring it back, but open the door and turn off the AC. Yeah, don't put yourself at risk because you wanted to put the AC and you close the door and you're just alone with a student. Um, if necessary, relocate to an area uh, with more people. All right. Um, and I hate to say this, uh, a lot more for us males, especially don't get caught in situations, yeah? Uh, driving students, there is actually a form for you to fill out if you're gonna drive a student in your personal car. You cannot just say, hey, jump in my car, I'll take you, okay? And this is for school kind of stuff. I would even avoid giving rides to students after school, okay? If they are driving in your car, make sure they wear the seatbelt. You're not using the cell phone. Students in the back and try to have two adults if possible, just so you get the backup, okay? And then I talked about this before, communication. Avoid friending students on social media. Always work through parents to communicate to a student. Okay, there's a workplace safety policy on page 12, 305-2. Uh, that we are all responsible for ensuring a safe and harmonious workplace. Report any potential incidents of workplace violence to me or your supervisor, uh, and workplace violence may result in disciplinary action up to and including termination. And just so you know, what's even worse than that is uh, if you do that and then you get somebody turns you in, the retaliation is even more uh, severe than a lot of times the actual act. Here we go, another school, another video, school communities. All goes together. This is about exemplifying the values of Aloha. School communities of compassion, dignity, and respect. In the state of Hawaii, Aloha permeates all of what we do, yeah. and it is the essence of Aloha that allows compassion, honor, dignity, and respect to share and end. Hawaii's public schools are dedicated to ensuring that all the public schools are providing the values that they have to Share these values by administrators, students, and staff that provide the foundation for a positive and caring school culture where students can learn and teach as can teach. Students cannot learn if they don't feel safe or caring. Teachers cannot perform at their best if not valued or supported. Why is the department focused on ensuring school and school safety? Facilities need to look safe and be safe. We need to present an image of the department cares about the folks who are on campus, cares about students. So the, the broken window theory that uh, somebody breaks a window in a building and they don't fix it right away, somebody else comes along and says, oh, bust this window, nobody cares about it. So it's like bust another window. Refuse the same way. Attend to those things immediately and send a message of be care. How significant is school climate for academic achievement? School climate is very important to be successful for school students. It's as fundamental as children attending school being well fed, being well rested. It's just taking care of very basic needs. Physically, psychologically, emotionally, so that children can Linking school safety and achievement. Quality school climate, quality relationships, and academic achievement go hand in hand. They are highly linked. A recent study by the Consortium on Chicago School Research at the University of Chicago, May 2011, found that in high poverty and high crime neighborhoods, the key to turning a school into a safer one was the quality relationship between adults and students. When students feel they can trust their teachers and parents feel teachers are partners in their child's education, these relationships become the most critical factor in school safety. What is school climate and culture all about? Responsibility and relationship. When staff building the relationship of parents, this is where our culture is born. If school culture could be strengthened, People working together, having the high standards, and relationship building. And through this, then honor, dignity, and respect can become a reality. When a school is safe, orderly, and compassionate, 
resolving academic challenges becomes much easier. How are some of the complex areas addressing school culture and the safety and well being of all students? Several of my schools have been using the touch process, some of them for almost 20 years. It's a process that looks to developing a culture that maximizes learning and team development. Some of the initiatives that are complex areas and our districts are engaged in include such things as a uh, quarterly safety meeting, which involves all of the Honolulu briefing offices from Kahuku to Waimanalo, as well as some of the agencies that we work with, and some of the parent groups uh, that constitute the neighborhood watch. And we try to work together in those meetings to resolve some of the issues that may impact our young people in and out of school uh, as it relates to safety. One of our initiatives has been working on with our classified staff to make sure that home etiquette and office etiquette is such that parents feel welcome when they're coming to our school. Uh, we're also very dedicated at this point to working on family engagement because safety is actually the responsibility of everyone. School and student safety is responsibility of all involved. Administrators, staff, teachers, students, families, and the school community. Safety is concerned for this entire school community. Um, situations do occur on campus, so we need to know, so our students and staff need to know how they should react, what they can do, where they can report it, we want them to be prepared. What happens if a student is bullied or harassed at school? Well, the very first thing, obviously, is that we have to care for the emotional, psychological, perhaps even unfortunate physical needs of the young so that we from the community and the age. Um, but yeah, this should be first taking care of that great need and work on the parents are concerned because you want parents and school working together with them. You're also going to be concerned about uh, dealing with the disciplinary and the educational work working with school perpetrators. So we will be looking at that as well as parents. What can we all do to contribute to a positive and caring school community? One of the things that is all of us to do is to live on the community. With their peers and other parents, we learn the positive things that are going on in the school. May be recognition of, um, for example, Aloha values. Uh, they can promote that at home, and, and that actually duplicates those values at home. The business community also can promote the many activities that schools have regarding uh, positive things that are happening at, at, at the school. They promote it as a business, and so there is. Uh, there's a unique situation on Kauai where we have a wound care program uh, campaign, we call it the mayor, and things like um, domestic violence, suicide, drug awareness. Um, we care for our students, the, uh, the mayor and I, because without uh, taking care of social issues, how can students learn the environment about positive and conducive for learning? Safety and well being are fundamental hallmarks of the department's efforts to ensure that we provide quality learning education and a quality learning environment. At school, when students and teachers are in the classroom, along with physical safety, they should feel emotionally and socially that they are safe. When they send their child out to school, parents should be assured that safety is being enforced and that they are in place for a safe learning environment. Even during difficult fiscal times, the safety of our learning environment must be preserved and can never be compromised. It is important to expect that all employees will be vigilant and alert to any circumstance which affects school safety. It is also important for school administrators and teachers to speak up to take positive action to receive bullying or unwanted behavior. It is our duty, it is our commitment to stop these types of behavior prevent them from occurring. Improved student achievement and learning is directly linked to a safe school environment. When students learn, they need to feel their school supports, promotes, and endorses. Teachers need to know their classrooms will not be disrupted when they are teaching and working with students. At the Hawaii State Department of Education, we are committed to providing a learning environment that supports and promotes safety and well being for improved student achievement.
That's two superintendents ago. <clears throat> it's, it's crazy. Some of those people are still working in the department. Okay, let me see. Let's uh, let's take a ten minute break in case you got to use the restroom, grab some more food, uh, whatever. So we'll come back at uh, nine thirty. All right, here we go. We're on page 13, 14 in your books if you have it up online. Otherwise, it's on the slide. So basically, we're talking about uh, the department's uh, drug-free workplace. Uh, there are acts and laws pertaining to a drug-free workplace. There are definitions of prohibited drugs and alcohol. The list is not exhaustive. Uh, you'll be subject to disciplinary action. Um, the conditions of employment are according to the Federal Drug-Free Workplace Act of 1988. Uh, and just so you know, there are counseling and rehabilitation programs uh, for this. Yeah, so even though some people might, you cannot be under the influence of anything really. Even over-the-counter medication, if you take too many, that still counts. Like you cannot be in an altered state because the basic premise is we're here to care for kids and we're around kids. Yeah. So if you chug a bottle of NyQuil right before work and you're sleepy, night, yeah, NyQuil might not be um, illegal, but you're not using it in the, in the manufacturer's intended purpose. You all understand? Got it. We did the breaker rating. Okay, technology, I was gonna have you guys read, but since it's electronic now, uh, we'll just talk about it real quick. Um, so the technology, uh, basically all the technology that you guys have, and if you're on our network, um, we can look at it, right? So you shouldn't be using your technology to do anything other than school-related things, yeah. So technically you shouldn't be on Facebook or Amazon Prime um, or setting up things. So you are liable for that once you get the technology. Yeah. So here are some notes that I put down about tech, okay? If you receive inappropriate material, like on your email, you cannot control necessarily what people send you, but you can control what you do with it after. So if you get a, like a, you know, an inappropriate picture, like a racist joke, something like that, uh, delete it. Do not forward it unless you're forwarding it to uh, myself or Casey to report it. Uh, but don't forward it on to your friends or whatnot, because then now you become liable for it. Uh, don't open a file if you don't know who it's from. Uh, you need to be checking your email minimum one time per day. I'm talking about your NES and your DOE uh, email accounts. Um, refrain from sending one-liner, one-liners like thanks and and oh okay. They do not advance the conversation in any way. Feel free to put no reply necessary at the top of the email when you don't anticipate a response. You're just giving information. It's a lot of people in the DOE that do this, but beware of the reply all. Do not hit reply all unless every member on the email chain needs to know. You wanna make sure that you're not sending everyone on your list your answer, whether they needed to know or not. That's super irritating. Every time there's people who just like go reply all. We don't need to hear from you. If you're doing a mass message to your class or whatever, I already told the teachers yesterday, use the BCC, that means People who receive it don't get to see the addresses of the other people. Yeah, so that remain, that helps to keep the confidentiality. So some other parent doesn't like go, oh, I got everybody's email. And then they start sending them, you know, solicitations for their business or whatever it might be. Um, and make sure you can put your own name in the, the two or CC fields. 
Uh, I do that sometimes when I send messages out to you guys just to ensure that it went out properly when I receive it. Um, and then just remember to be careful with confidential information. Know who you're quote unquote talking to, especially in an email and on the phone as well. Yeah, because anybody can try to be anybody. We've had people try to disguise who they are on the phone and get information. Um, mm -hmm. Attorneys are especially um, like, sneaky about that kind of stuff any questions on tech cool oh hope you guys finish eating there we go why did this send me here Bloodborne pathogens. Here we go. Parental access via a needle stick, 
or an injection by a contaminated needle, sexual intercourse, and prenatally, from mother to child, through the placenta. Bloodborne pathogens like HIV and hepatitis B are not transmitted through casual contact, like sneezing, shaking hands, and using public records or drinking fountains. The human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV, is one type of bloodborne pathogen. HIV specifically attacks the T cells of the immune system. Gradually, the HIV destroys so many immune system cells that the body can no longer effectively fight infection and disease. This final stage of the infection is known as acquired immune deficiency syndrome, or AIDS. Not everyone with HIV advances to AIDS. As of now, there is no cure for this disease and no vaccine to prevent infection. There are federal and state protection laws requiring the inclusion of HIV positive students. Students with HIV cannot be denied access to school. In accordance with the Working Revised Statutes 55 101, all health information regarding an individual's HIV status, whether written or verbal, shall be treated with strict confidentiality. Persons informed of the student's HIV status. May not disclose this information to anyone without specific written consent of the parent or legal guardian. Violation of this confidentiality may be subject to financial penalty. Although HIV has been more publicized, hepatitis B has a greater prevalence. Hepatitis, which means inflammation of the liver, reduces the liver's ability to process nutrients, fight infection, and filter blood. Hepatitis B signs and symptoms range in severity. From a mild illness lasting a few weeks to a chronic lifelong ailment. For those at risk of occupational exposure, the Centers for Disease Control and OSHA recommend receiving the hepatitis B vaccination. The DOE has established three categories of employees at risk for bloodborne pathogen exposure in the workplace. This list of tasks and procedures, or groups of closely related tasks and procedures, may lead to occupational exposure for employees in job classification categories one and two. Refer to section one of the exposure control plan for specifics. All employees in category one perform tasks or procedures that involve exposure risks to bloodborne pathogens in the work setting. In category two, some employees have job classifications with risks to occupational exposure. Each school or office will identify teachers and educational assistants who are regularly and routinely exposed to students with bodily care and cleanup needs, or serve students with behaviors that present a risk of transmission. These Category 1 and Category 2 employees need special training in universal precautions to prevent occupational exposure. Category 3 employees have no tasks and work assignments involving occupational exposure. Category 3 employees should keep additional equipment to clean up or address situations involving blood or other potentially infectious material. Except for the specific jobs identified in categories 1 and 2, all other employees of the DOE fall within this category. Please note part time, temporary, contract, and per diem employees, as well as volunteers, must also be aware of the bloodborne pathogen standard and view this video. DOE employees in job categories one and two, including substitutes, part time, temporary, contract, and per diem employees, will be offered the vaccine series free of charge or be required to sign a waiver acknowledging their refusal. Hepatitis B vaccinations must be offered after the employee has received the required blood borne pathogens training and within 10 days of the new assignment to jobs and occupational exposure. If in doubt, an employee can consult his or her personal physician before deciding to take or refuse the vaccine. Universal precaution is the prevention of birth to infect and control. Employees must know how to use universal precaution to prevent exposure to bloodborne pathogens. For your protection, consider all human blood and other potentially infectious materials as possibly infected. So practice universal precaution at all times. Contact with bloodborne pathogens only pose a risk to you if you can enter your bloodstream. So potentially dangerous situations may not be obvious if an accident involving blood. For example, it is not uncommon for a sick child to vomit at school. Since there is a slight possibility that the vomit contains some blood, a risk of exposure is greater, although rare. 
Your skin is the first line of defense. When unbroken or intact, it is your best barrier against infection. Both the hepatitis B and HIV virus appear to be incapable of penetrating intact skin. Use universal precautions to handle any situation where there is a potential risk of transmission. The universal precautions procedure is always the same. Use appropriate personal protective equipment, like gloves and eye protection. Disinfect the area. Properly dispose of infectious waste and wash hands thoroughly, even if gloves were worn during treatment of the injury and cleanup. If you come into contact with blood or other potentially infectious material, the most important step is to first wash the hands thoroughly with soap and water. Hand washing is easy to do and is one of the most effective ways to prevent the spread of any type of infection or illness by all settings. Use liquid soap to prevent it. Bar soap is not recommended, as the bar can carry germs to others. If soap and water are not available, use an alcohol-based sanitizer that has at least 50% alcohol. For more information on hand washing, visit the Centers for Disease Control website. When responding to an exposure incident, follow the universal conference and drug practice controls to minimize your risk of exposure. There are some common areas of exposure in the school setting. Provide first aid as necessary and always practice universal precautions. In response to accident occurs or minor accidents, put gloves before treating the injury. Gloves provide an effective protective barrier from any blood or other potentially infectious material. Check the gloves for punctures or holes. A small cut or open sore provides an entryway for a local pathogen to get its sore into your bloodstream. If gloves are unavailable, give the injured person several tissues, paper towels, or other sort of material. Instruct the person to apply pressure on their own wound, stop the bleeding until proper medical care can be provided. Certain bloodborne pathogens, like the hepatitis B virus, can live for days outside the body and still cause infection in dry blood. To prevent infection and cross contamination, all equipment, environmental, and working surfaces should be cleaned and decontaminated as soon as possible using the EPA approved disinfectant. The following disinfectants may be used isopropyl alcohol, sodium hypochlorite, such as Clorox or Purina which is diluted one part bleach to 10 parts water, or any EPA germicidal solution makes according to the manufacturer's directions. To disinfect the contaminated surface, first put on gloves, check it for any holes, and replace it if necessary. Next, spray the disinfectant on the contaminated surface and allow several minutes for the disinfectant to work. Wipe it dry with paper towels or wipes, and properly dispose of any contaminated materials. Items that may be contaminated should only be picked up using mechanical means, like a brush and dustpan or tongs. Clean and disinfect such implements and bins or pails that were used during cleanup. Even if gloves are worn for the treatment of the injury and during cleanup, remember to finish with effective hand washing and drying. DOE employees may be exposed to bloodborne pathogens present in regulated waste. Regulated wastes are materials that are liquid, semi liquid, or other potentially infectious material. Contaminated items that would release blood or other potentially infectious material in a liquid or semi liquid state if compressed. Items that are caked with dried blood or other potentially infectious material and capable of releasing these materials during handling. Contaminated sharps like syringes and battery packs. In order for schools and offices to be compliant with high off regulations, they must be equipped with red biohazard bags, biohazard labels, covered biohazard disposal containers with biohazard warning labels attached, and red sharps disposal containers. Each school is responsible for maintaining their own supply of these materials. Failure to do so may subject the school to HIOSH and State Department of Health citations and financial penalties. Not every classroom needs a red biohazard bag. The red biohazard bags and labels only need to be in the central location where regulated place is kept in place so them, such as the health room. Red biohazard bags are to be used only for disposing of materials containing regulated waste, 
or other potential infectious material. Biohazard labels are only used on other sealed containers or bags which contain regulated waste or other potential infectious material for disposal. So how do you dispose of regulated waste? All regulated waste material must be placed in a red biohazard bag or a foodable bag or container labeled as biohazardous. The red bag or container must be sealed and placed in the covered biohazard waste container for proper disposal. All red biohazard bags or items labeled as biohazardous are required to be disposed of by a licensed contractor and may not be placed in regular trash for disposal. Doing so may subject the school to citations from Pinoch and the State Department of Health. OSHA does not generally consider feminine hygiene products, band aids, or bandages as regulated waste. According to the State Department of Health, these items may be disposed of as regular solid waste. Schools will be responsible for contracting their own state licensed vendor to properly dispose of their regulated waste. When handling sharks disposal containers, Refer to the OSHA fact sheet, protecting yourself from handling contaminated sharks. Contaminated sharks can be discarded immediately in containers that are closable, puncture resistant, leak proof on signs and bonds, and appropriately labeled for cover coating. Please see the school or office site plan for the location of sharks disposal containers. In the event of an explosion, employees and supervisors must follow the post exposure incident procedure. In section four of the exposure control plan. An exposure incident is defined as a reasonably anticipated skin, eye, mucous membrane, or parenteral contact with blood or other potentially infectious material that may result from the performance of an employee's duties. So, what are your responsibilities in responding to an exposure incident? If you have possibly been exposed to blood or other potentially infectious material, Seek immediate first aid or wound care as needed. Cleanse the area of exposure with soap and water, then rinse thoroughly with water. Contact your immediate supervisor and complete the employee exposure report immediately. Your principal or supervisor can provide assistance on the completion of forms. Post exposure evaluations and follow up are provided free of charge to employees. Obtain confidential medical evaluation and follow up by your attending physician or healthcare professional who will need to perform several activities involving documentation and testing. The principal or administrator must obtain essential information and complete form PP 110, providing the employee's healthcare professional with proper documents, advise the employee on required forms for the position, prepare form WC1, employer's report of industrial injury. If the employee was absent from work more than one day or requires medical treatment beyond ordinary first aid, and investigate the exposure incident and complete form PP100 regarding the exposure incident to refine or improve the exposure control plan at the school or office. The school or office must also maintain worker records, a sharp injury log, and training documentation. In closing, the exposure control plan is meant to prevent on the job employee exposure to blood borne pathogens through the practice of universal precautions, implementation of engineering, and work practice controls, and use of personal protective equipment. To provide a continual program of orientation, training, and procedural compliance, and to ensure prompt follow up care of employees exposed to a of blood body fluids, or other potentially infectious materials while performing work-related tasks. The overall goal is to keep you healthy and safe. Consult the DOE Bloodborne Pathogens Exposure Control Plan and review the frequently asked questions. If you need further assistance, please contact your administrator or call the Safety, Security, and Emergency Preparedness Branch at 784-5170. You can also send an email to mark.barris at k12.hi.us. Mahalo for watching the print. <clears throat> Any questions? Um, can you guys just maybe keep the conversation down when the videos are playing? Because it is going, it is being recorded and they can hear you guys talking in the background.
Next video. Welcome to the training for the Department of Education's Hazard Communication Program. The whole EPA is firmly committed to providing a safe and healthy work environment for each of its employees. This weekly language training is designed to provide employees with pertinent information and training on chemical hazards in the workplace. The Human Hazard Communication Program has been revised to be compliant with this new standard. It includes an update to the Hazard Communication Standard, or HCS. Which aligns with the global permanent system for classification and labeling of chemicals, otherwise known as GHs. This training will include an overview of the hazard communication standard or HCF, the new labeling requirements, the new 16 section format of the revised safety data sheet, also known as SDF, record keeping forms and requirements, training requirements for DOD employees, and the Hazard Communication Program Implementation Plan. In 1983, the U.S. Department of Labor's Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, established the Hazard Communication Standard, or HCS. This standard gave employees the right to know what hazardous chemicals were being used in the workplace and how to protect themselves from these hazards. In May of 2012, OSHA established its new HCS, which emphasizes the employee's right to understand. This federal and state mandate adopted the GHS to clearly communicate the identity and potential dangers of hazardous chemicals or substances in the workplace through the use of pictograms, signal work, and safety data sheets, SDF, which were formerly called Material Safety Data Sheets, MSDF. This new standard is to be fully implemented by June 1, 2016. This is an example of the new label style that is to appear on product labels by June 1st. 2015, or no later than December 1st, 2015, for distributors who still have product in inventory. There are several new label requirements, which are noted in blue on this sample label. The actual statement and information will vary depending on the specific health and physical classification of the product. Labels must have a product identifier or the chemical identity of the substance. The supplier's identification. Precautionary statements, which provide information on potential hazards and proper procedures. The GHS has a pictogram, which identifies the type of hazard through a black symbol on a white background that is framed by a red diamond. One signal word, danger or warning. Hazard statements, which describe the nature of the hazard. And supplemental information, which is required on the FDM, but not the label. It will include information the supplier wants to communicate, like routes of exposure, hazard prevention, and emergency response instructions. Secondary containers, like spray bottles or unmarked containers, must also be done comply with the new page of labeling requirement, if not used immediately by the employee who transferred the product from its initial or primary container. Depending on the type of shipping container, you may also see a required Department of Transportation label along with the OSHA label. Do not remove or mark up this label. Quick review. The previous hazard communication standard was the employee's right to know. The new standard is the right to understand. There are nine types of pictograms used to identify health hazards, physical hazards, or environmental hazards. Eight are regulated by the Hawaii Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or HIOP, and OSHA. The environmental hazards are regulated by the Department of Health, or DOH. Depending on the chemical or substance, there may be more than one pictogram on a label, and it should be shown the same way on the SCF. The skull and crossbone pictogram means the substance is very dangerous and can be potentially deadly. The exclamation mark represents harmful chemicals and irritants that are considered less toxic in comparison to those labeled with a stone and crossbar. The pictogram of the silhouetted person shows that the chemical is a health hazard capable of creating long-term and or target organ damage. Most employees should be familiar with the pictogram for corrosion. It can represent both a health and or physical hazard. These chemicals and substances can cause skin corrosion, serious eye damage, and eye irritation. 
it can also mean you cannot open the corrosive to metal. Not all health hazards represented by the staking ramp are corrosive to metal. So it's important to look for that additional information on the label and in the SEM. The pictogram of the explosive is a physical hazard referring to the substance that can break down rapidly under certain conditions and produce gases that expand due to the heat of the reaction, like self-reactive pyrophoric gases. The next pictogram is for physical hazards that are flammable, like combustible dust. The cylinder pictogram depicts gases under pressure and includes any gas contained in a pressurized container or as a refrigerated liquid. The pictogram of the flame over the circle represents oxidizing, which includes materials or gases that easily give off oxygen and cause other materials to become fire hazards. The environment pictogram with the dead upside down fish means the substance is harmful to aquatic life. Let's review. Find the pictograms on the label. This product is categorized as both a physical hazard with a flammable classification and a health hazard with an acute toxicity classification. Now find the signal. This product is considered dangerous. What are the hazard statements? This product is toxic if swallowed. It is also considered a flammable liquid and vapor. Identify the precautionary statements. These phrases of warning describe recommended measures that should be taken to minimize or prevent adverse effects. Locate the product identification. This is the name of the chemical. Now find the supplier manufacturer identification. And in this case, the other supplemental information is provided on the FCM. Under the new hazard communication standard, material safety data sheet. MSDS are now called safety data sheets, FCF. The SDF is now the standard document for each hazardous chemical in the workplace. The new 16 section format explains how to read and use the SDF and includes the same information required on labels. The SDS binder should be kept in a central administrative location, like the school office. This binder contains an SDX or MSDX for every chemical used or is an inventory. Every chemical must be logged alphabetically by chemical name on the hazardous chemicals inventory master list. Other information recorded includes common trade name, manufacturer, where the chemical is used, when the chemical was first used, or if it is no longer used, indicate the last date of use. It also confirms that the FDF or MSDF is on file. Every work area using chemicals, such as the science lab, custodian closet, cafeteria, shop class, health room, must have a site-specific SDS binder. This binder contains SDSs for all chemicals used at the work area. These chemicals are recorded on the workplace chemical inventory list in alphabetical order by chemical name, and include trade name, manufacturer, container size, and amount on hand. Documentation must still be maintained for chemicals no longer used. Complete the record of chemicals no longer used form and place it in a separate FDF and FDS archive binder. Keep these records in a central administrative location for at least 30 years since the last known use of the chemical. Manufacturers, importers, and distributors must use the new 16 section format SDS beginning no later than June 1, 2015, and are required to provide the revised copy of the SDS any time changes are made. When placing orders, request the SDS and labels for secondary containers from the supplier. Another option is to obtain them through the internet. Do not create your own SDS, as this makes you liable for the information. OSHA requires employers to maintain the most recently received versions of the MSDS or SDS. Therefore, employers must replace the older versions of the MSDS or SDS as they are received. Establish a system to ensure all SDSs are present and periodically yeah. check to see if you are using the most current SDS version, usually based on revision date. No hazardous materials will be used in the workplace unless an SDS has been received 
and it's on file in the work area. Under the SDF binder located in the central administrative location. Employers must ensure that all SCF and MSDFs are readily accessible to all employees. So keep it with the Hazard Communications Program Manual and archive an SES binder at a central administrative location. Besides any electronic copies maintained, the current paper copy must be available for rapid access in case of emergency. Quick review True or false? Hazard statements. Signal words and pictograms are required on chemical labels and SES. The correct answer is true, and the contents should be the same on both. School principals or worksite coordinators must provide all workers with hazard communication training. They must also document the training and keep a record of employees' training. General training must be provided to all new employees, part time, and full time upon hire. Specific training must be provided to affected employees whenever new chemicals are introduced into their immediate workplace. These employees shall be notified of any changes to work procedures or personal protective equipment that is required to protect their health and safety. Before using PPEs like ventilation devices, gloves, and safety glasses, supervisors must complete a job hazard analysis. Remember, chemical specific information must be readily available through labels and SDFs upon request to employees and their designated representatives. As required by federal law, employers maintaining both MSDFs and SDFs must reflect this in their hazard communication program and training to ensure that employees are aware of the differences between the SDS and MSDS. Understanding GHS labeling standards and how to utilize both the SDF and MSDF to protect themselves in the workplace. OSHA specifies the training requirements for field employees in the following areas methods and observations that may be used to detect the presence or release of hazardous chemicals in the work area, health, physical, and environmental hazards of chemicals in the work area, measures employees can take to protect themselves from these hazards, including appropriate work practices procedures, and personal protective equipment. Details of the hazard communication program developed by the employer to include an explanation of labels received on shift containers, the workplace labeling system, and the SDF, as well as the hazard communication record-keeping forms and mandatory practices. How can you protect yourself from these hazards? All DOE employees are responsible for maintaining a safe workplace by understanding and following their hazard communication program. Also, adhere to the SDS guideline. Store chemicals in their proper environment. Consider modified storage facilities like shelves with lifts to prevent accidental spills. Use appropriate personal protective equipment, PPE, as advised by the SDS. For chemicals that are old or no longer used, dispose according to the SDS recommendations. Practice good housekeeping. Face the labels forward. Segregate supplies by groups. Avoid storing reactive products together, like ammonia and bleach. For donated materials, site managers must have appropriate screening procedures. This prevents schools and work sites from unnecessarily accepting materials that would pose additional problems. In July 2009, the state of Hawaii enacted legislation under House Bill 1538, which was meant to protect children, teachers, and staff from the harmful health effects of toxic cleaning products. The DOE is required to give first preference, where feasible, to the purchase and use of environmentally sensitive cleaning and maintenance products, which have been approved by the Green Seal Program. To protect Hawaii's natural environment, try to purchase less toxic materials and purchase only what is needed to minimize waste. For further information, please see the DOE memo posted October 4, 2013, titled Green Cleaner Requirement for Hawaii Public Schools. Your school or work site should be checked on a regular basis for any chemical releases like spills or leaks. Look for changes in the products or chemicals' visual appearance. Track any observable chemicals, spills, or leaks, and note any unusual smelling odors. 
Respond to any leaks and spills according to the SES. Follow your individual worksite plans for the prevention and preparedness of chemical releases or spills. Response procedures for indoor or outdoor releases and recovery guidelines for restoring the work environment. The success of the DOE hazard communication program depends greatly on the cooperation of every employee. So understand the new hazard communication standard and be alert to potential hazards in your work area. Consult the SDS or MSDS for the specifics concerning the use, storage, and disposal of these hazardous chemicals. Follow appropriate work practices that have been established to protect your health and safety. Your continued participation in the hazard communication program will result in the continued reduction of chemical related illnesses and injuries. SDF information is uniquely shared between the site manager and any contractor working on department facilities. In closing, we hope this training has helped you understand the hazard communication standard updates, including the globally harmonized system of classification and labeling of chemicals. Remember, all SDSs and labels will look the same now, so know how to use them. Ensure you have current SDSs and archive any old MSDSs, which must be kept for at least 30 years after its last known use. Refer to SDS for proper use, storage, handling, and responses to chemical exposure. Keep the hazardous communication program manual. The SDS and MSDS binder including the hazardous chemical inventory form, and another binder for archive MSDS and SDS, including the record of chemicals no longer used in a central administrative location. That way, it is acceptable to all employees. Keep paper copies of the SDSs or MSDSs at the actual work site, along with the workplace chemical inventories. It allows for easier reference and enables a quicker response in the event of an emergency. Although electronic copies may be kept, Hard or paper copies must be maintained so that the hazard communication information is always available. In the event of power failures or system outages, any electronic copies would be inaccessible. Printed SDX and labels can be requested from the supplier. For additional questions related to the information industry, please contact the Safety, Security, and Emergency Preparedness Branch at 808 586. 3457, or send an email by Lotus Notes to safetyhawaii at notes.k12.hi.us. Mahalo for watching this training video. Working together and under. All righty, moving on. Hang in there. All right, talking about uh, leaves of absences, uh, page 19. So everyone needs to follow the proper procedure for filling out leave forms for teachers and myself. We use 300-001 for uh, CAF and office uh, custodial. You guys use form G1. All employees are responsible and required to give prior notification and obtain approval from myself prior to taking any leave of absence. The only exceptions are if you're sick or if you have an emergency. Uh, and even in those cases, you should let us know as soon as you can. Um, teachers, you should arrange to have a sub or put the job in TCs in a timely manner. As soon as you know you're not coming in, don't wait till seven o'clock in the morning because that puts us in a bad spot. Okay, so as soon as you can, if you don't know uh, who the subs we generally use are, uh, talk to your colleagues. Uh, if you don't have my cell, it's right there, 808-375-4000. Um, our main line, you can email, you can go to NES website for the school number. Um, there really is no excuse for not notifying us um, if you're not going to be uh, available. Okay. So this is for teachers and admin, sick leave. Uh, you're responsible and required to notify uh, me if, for each day of your absence. Basically, if you put it in TCs, then I know, right? If you don't show up and we're like, where the heck is somebody? Uh, that's not good. Upon return from illness, the first day of return, you need to 
uh, put in your forms. Okay. And if you're, if you're out for five or more consecutive days, it requires a doctor's note. Um, if you get COVID, uh, there is COVID leave, I think up for up to five days. And then after that, um, the COVID quarantine leave. And then after that, it, I think it transfers to your sick leave. Um, for the five days, you will need to get a doctor's note. Uh, when I had COVID, I basically uh, just called my doctor and said, hey, I took a home test. I'm positive. You know, I don't want to come in. I know I'm sick. And they just emailed me a note. So hopefully your doctor can do the same. Um, Smart Find Express is TCs, yeah. And then otherwise, um, if you don't do the proper leave procedures, it can be uh, unauthorized leave without pay. And if you get too much of that, then it, it actually, um, we can do a uh, disciplinary measure or it can also be, it'll also be considered as um, but affecting your service rendered, so on your retirement, if you have too many of those. Uh, teachers, personally, please use this statement. You don't need to give me the details, okay? So when you, if you're trying to take your personal leave, right, for personal business, which can be transacted, can, transacted only during school hours. I don't need to know otherwise. You're taking personal leave, and I forget how many you guys get. Six, something like that. And it's charged to your sick leave. Okay. Um, and I'll just say this about sick leave. Sick leave is for you not to care for other people. Okay. That's because you're sick, not because your child or your mom or your dad or somebody is sick. If you're going to do that, there are other avenues to go down to be able to take care of that. Um, one of them is that family leave. Didn't we, did we give you guys that? The family leave. So if you got to take care of a, uh, a family member who is ill, that's the leave you use, not your sick leave. Although ultimately it will come out of your sick leave. You got to do the proper thing. Okay. And if you have questions about that, you can go see Kim. Uh, personal leave is not intended for you to extend vacations uh, or intercessions and holidays. Um, and you should avoid uh, or avoid attending waiver planning collaboration days. So as I stated yesterday, your guys' collaboration day this year is on a Friday. And lo and behold, it's a holiday on Monday. You guys shouldn't be taking off on the Friday for the waiver day and making a four-day weekend. Okay, for everybody else, all the other bargaining units, uh, sick leave, you, should, uh, you can notify me or you can notify your supervisor uh, of what's going on prior to your start time. Slightly different for you guys. Uh, again, return from illness, you got to fill out your forms right away. Five or more consecutive days, you guys need a doctor's note as well. Um, for personal leave, it's for business that can only be, but you guys get vacation, right? Not personal leave, vacation. So if you can take vacation slash personal leave, uh, should be for you know whatever you need to. Um, it should be in advance, not the day before. You want to take it, unless again it's an emergency, then you try to give me as much time as you can. Um, and then without proper authorization, it's leave it up. It. Any questions on leave? It's pretty standard. It's, it has nothing has changed. So this is what I was talking about: the family leave notice for all employees. Uh, so employees with 12 months of cumulative employment and a minimum of 1,250 hours of service. Um, an employee must be at least a 62.5% full-time employee. In the previous 12 months, you qualify um, for this family leave. And there's two different kinds. There's one for the state and one for the federal government. Um, and we can work with you guys on how what would be best. Okay. That's why you're not supposed to take sick leave to go take care of uh, other people. Because there is a leave that takes care of that. And here are the qualifying reasons. To care for a spouse, child, or parent with a serious health condition uh, for birth and to bond with the new, no, newborn, blah, 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 all the way through. Okay. All right, moving on. Oh, any questions on that? Okay, moving on. 
Uh, on page 24, there's a notice of non-discrimination and anti-harassment. Goes along with all the other stuff that's been put out there in the code of conduct and whatnot. You know, basically there are state and federal guidelines about um, discrimination. Um, and if you are feel like you're being discriminated against or harassed, please, by all means, um, report that to me. If you think I'm the one who's discriminating and harassing against you, then you go to the CAVS. Okay, don't come to me if you think I'm discriminating. And all. It doesn't work that way. Um, and as you see on the bottom, it says retaliation towards those who report such incidents will not be tolerated. Um, some of the classes that are that are protected, uh, race, color, sex, religion, national origin, ancestry, age, physical or mental disability, sexual orientation, marital status, arrest, and court record, income assignment for child support, National Guard, absence, uniform service, breastfeeding, or citizen status. It was covered all in the video that we watched. Okay. And then again, retaliation is prohibited. Um, and that we try to do, we try to provide reasonable accommodations for people, say with like disabilities or whatnot, uh, if you're breastfeeding or whatever it may be. Um, some people with COVID, we found, you know, they're, um, they're more susceptible, um, you know, like to the virus and its effects because they're immune, immune compromised. You know, we try to make accommodations in those kind of cases. Um, so any, any kind of harassment or bullying is strictly prohibited. Again, the classes and whatnot. Um, a student shall not be excluded from participation in, be denied benefits of, or otherwise be subjected to harassment, bullying, or discrimination under any DOE-sponsored activity. That leads into the thing that we talked about, about bullying and cyberbullying and harassment. We got to teach our kids about things because they may, they may think it's just, you know, that's what they see in their neighborhood, but we got to teach them that's not how they do, they're not supposed to do things. Any questions on the anti-harassment, anti-bullying, anti-discrimination? It's pretty straightforward. On page 27, there is a statement on equity of students of all socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, so it's not allowed as a condition for a grade or extra credit to have kids uh, engage in activities outside of school. You cannot force them to say, you got to go to this, uh, watch this movie or go to this play or attend this activity because it's part of your grade. Probably more like at the high school level. Yeah. Um, bringing items for fundraising purposes. Um, purchase materials as part of the student supply list. Um, we recommend and have the student supply list, but if they don't, then we try to give them what they need. Yeah. So if you guys got any students who don't have, um, especially those that like say are at Vancouver house or whatnot, no worries. We got plenty of supplies in the office. It's not like we just give free supplies to everybody. It's those who cannot really afford. And then we help them out. Yeah. So if you, if kids don't have stuff, just let AI, Jen or myself know, and we'll put something together for them. Okay or uh, requiring them to bring in money. Um, they gotta bring in money for field trips. That's not what we're talking about. Okay. All right, confidentiality. Normally at this point, we would watch the FERPA video, but I think everybody watched that video in the last five years. Yes? Cool. If you didn't, you can watch it on your own. How's that? So we can save some time. We don't have to watch it every year. We just have to watch it every five years. Okay. And if you didn't, then you can watch it on your own. Uh, and then there's a sheet that you can, I think, print out to confirm that you did the whole thing. Okay. Uh, but essentially, you do have to sign this form and put it in the back about confidentiality. Uh, just a couple notes about that. <clears throat> you shouldn't be leaving stuff on your desk that's easily seen by students or um, like at open house, don't leave sensitive information about kids around that other parents can see. Um, and sensitive information, I'm not talking about a picture that you're hanging up in your classroom now. You know, got their address. It's personally identifiable information. Yeah. That people cannot just look over and then like take a quick snapshot of it and then they have something about people. 
Uh, believe it or not, there are students uh, just about every year, um, just about every year that are hiding because maybe a nasty divorce or something, custody kind of deal, and they don't want the other person to know where they're at. Um, so really when you do that um, student publication, audio, video one, you gotta abide by that because some of those kids and parents don't want their faces to be shown on pictures and things like that. And that's one of the big reasons. Because if somebody can go on the internet and Google and search their name and get a lead as to where they are, it can cause problems. Okay, so just be cautious about that. So keep the information as confidential as you can. Okay. So you gotta sign the expectations. Yeah, so make sure you turn that in today. We did the FERPA video training. If you didn't see the FERPA video, this is the page that you can go to to click on the video and watch it and do everything you need to do. This is personally, oh, this terrorist slide is terrible. Um, personally identifiable information um, is kind of the same as directory information. I know you can't really see it. It's like student's name, address, date of birth, place of birth, a mother's maiden name, a photograph, Individually, some of these things are safe, but when you start to combine it together, then it becomes personally identifiable. And that's what the FERPA video kind of goes over. It's very confusing. Sometimes I got to call data governance and go, hey, can we do this or that? If you guys ever have a question as to whether or not you can do something, um, then just consult me. And if I don't know, then I just go up to data governance and ask them, okay? Because they say it when they do the training, like it's super confusing. But it's a federal, it's a federal thing, yeah. Um, so when I had said earlier, like know who you're talking to, that's a big part of that too. Yeah. Now, if you're calling somebody, that's different than if they're calling you now, because you're initiating and you have their phone number. You kind of know more like I'm purposely calling this person. Um, so we can't release information willy-nilly so um the other thing that we need to consider is sometimes people are taking university classes and they want to do a study um, those things need to be vetted by the doe um so don't just give information out say to like your student teacher or somebody who says hey can i do this because of my class you need to ask me first okay so don't let just let that information go out <laughs> If they're doing like a study that they're going to put in a paper and all that kind of stuff and publish, some people like to do the, you know, they're doing it for their doctorate or whatever, right? Or master's degree and they're going to put an exhibit and going to have the kids' names and all. We got to know that they got to go through the process through the DOE. So even for you guys, if you're doing a doctorate or something to that effect, if you want to do a research thing in schools, you got to go through the DOE and do it the proper way. Okay. So just to keep all the information confidential. Typically in the DOE, there's processes for everything. You just gotta ask. So typically, if you're just gonna go and jam it, uh, you can try, but if somebody finds out, then you can be in big trouble, okay? All right, chapter 19. There's a video for this. Welcome to this presentation on reporting class A and class B offenses occurring in school. Board of Administrative Rules, Title 8, Chapter 19, Student Misconduct, Discipline, School Searches and Seizures, Reporting Offenses, Police Interviews and Arrests, and Restitution for Vendors. This presentation is to inform and remind all schools and offices that failure to report Board of Administrative Rules, Section 8, 1919. Class A and Class B offenses may result in disciplinary action against the responsible peoples, officials, or other employees of the Hawaii State Department of Education. Hawaii Administrative Rules, Title 8, Chapter 19, Section 8, 1990, clearly state that any teacher, official, or other employee of the DOE who is witness to a Class A or Class B offense as defined by Chapter 19, or who has reasonable cause to believe 
that a class A or class B offense has been committed or will be committed against a student, teacher, official, or other employee of the DOE, or involved in school property, shall promptly report the incident to the principal or designee. Nothing in this section shall be construed to prohibit or prevent the teacher, official, or other employee of the department from reporting Class C or Class D offenses to the principal or designee. This includes the following location and situation on campus or other DOE premises, on DOE transportation, or during DOE sponsored activity or event on or off school property. Teachers, officials, or other employees of the department who fail to report Class A or Class D offenses as required by this section of Chapter 19 may be disciplined in accordance with the regulations and procedures of the department. Any teacher, official, or other employee of the department who is disciplined for failing to report Class A or Class D offenses occurring on campus or other Department of Education premises, on Department of Education transportation, or during a Department of Education sponsored event, on or off property, shall have the right to appeal the disciplinary action as provided by state law or the regulations and procedures of the department or applicable collective bargaining agreements. Mahalo. Thank you for reporting. Short one. Or class of offenses promptly in contributing to the safety and well being of all of our students. For further information, refer to Board of Administrative Rules at 8 Chapter 19. And go to the website www.ordboe.net slash admin rules slash pages slash admin rules. Okay, we get that. <clears throat> see. A few more videos and we're pile, guys. Woohoo. Okay, so just to reiterate, um, class A and class B. Um, Class A are those major ones like assault, um, burglary, extortion, fighting, firearms, harassment for grades high school age, bullying for high school age, uh, drugs, so on and so forth. The, the ones that we are concerned more about uh, will be class B offenses on the elementary level will be bullying, cyberbullying, uh, harassment, retaliation. Uh, and if, even to a certain extent, uh, the inappropriate or questionable uses of both the internet materials or equipment. So if they're not using our technology uh, in the right way. Right. That was a little bit more of a concern when we had all the technology out during the shutdown. I think it's a little bit better now. Um, including all oh, theft is also in there. Um, Sexual harassment is kind of interesting. It's a uh, class A offense for fifth grade and a class B offense for K through four. Any ideas why? Because we do sex ed in fifth grade. So that's why they should know better because they're taught. So um, you're indemnified if you report a class A or class B offense to me. Um, if you don't, and we find out later, then there's you may be subject to disciplinary measures because you didn't report it. Okay. And a lot of people like to use the B word, the bully word, for a lot of stuff. If that word comes up, you gotta come see us. Okay, because especially if it deals with a protected class, that actually goes up to civil rights, and they do the investigation, not me, because they don't play around with that kind of stuff anymore. I already just went over this. Class C are like abusive language, insubordination. Our kids are pretty good. They don't really do this kind of stuff. And then class D are like school rules and contraband. So just remind your kids. I forgot to say this yesterday. Remind your kids not to bring toys and all that kind of stuff to school. Even if it's in their backpack and they're like, oh, we're saving it for A+. They shouldn't even be bringing it out at A+. Okay. Cell phones. Um, I know some of them, they have cell phones, shouldn't be coming out of their, their bags at all. Yeah, Because if they lose it or it's broken, that's not our responsibility. Any questions on Chapter 19? Cool. We're almost done. I think four videos and we're done, guys. Home stretch, okay? 
Here we go. And back to this again. Holy crap. Let's see. Oh, it says old school, this one. Welcome to a special education program in front of the school staff of the proper procedure for parents with students suspected of a disability. The purpose of this program is to provide support staff with training when referring a parent who suspects their child has a disability. A while ago, there was an incident where a parent asked a support staff employee for assistance in getting services for their child. The parent suspected the child had a disability. The support staff did not work in the classroom and failed to notify the proper school authority. Although the support staff was not in the classroom and had no knowledge of the special education process, the parent had an expectation that the support staff member would know who to contact. The student's education suffered because of the loss of a year of special education service. To prevent further incidents, this training video is to inform support staff members on the proper procedures when they are approached by a parent. What will follow are three scenarios with various support staff employees who work in a school but outside of a classroom. In each scenario, a parent or guardian will approach the employee and casually tell the employee about their child's disability. Let's look at Auntie Luana, the cafeteria worker. Good morning, Auntie Luana. You know, I wasn't really last year with Nicole helping her with her homework. You know, she's in the third grade with me, and she still has a trouble reading. You know, sometimes, you know, she has to go over things with her. I should read it out loud, explain it over and over again, but she still has time. Okay, you know, it's like he forgets things, or he sometimes makes things up. You know, she's doing her best. But you know, it does not have thought. I mean, when I'm worried about the horse, is like, oh, she, you know, it's like she's being, you know, what to do. And you know, you know, we were here for a long time, yeah. even to when I was here. And, you know, I just don't know what to do. Oh, I don't know. Oh, she's such a great one. I don't know. She's fine. Oh, look at the time. Can't get the head on. One to give me your number, and uh, I'll say what I can do. It's kind of just a slow learning. Not as long as you can do. You're welcome. Bye. In the scenario you just saw, the cafeteria worker did not follow the current procedures. The current course of action would have been to tell the class to go to the office and make an appointment with the principal. The principal will be able to provide assistance and information to the parent or the guardian. Let's take a look at the next scenario in which the school security guard who is off campus sees the parent named Russell. Hey, Russell, good to see you. And on two other brothers, you were feeling them. And you told me you guys were in that um, death box prison from the outside of the world. Uh, what do you think you did? Oh, that makes great. You owe that to your father, you know. He, he was the great fisherman. He was the one that knew how to, where all the fishes were, he had the fish eye. Right. He could spot them a mile away. And after he could, he had a good ear, too. And this is how he could take them bottom, he could hear them. And uh, by gosh, I really miss him again. I was here to help me raise my kids. Uh, okay. Are you uh, still up in the school? Doing yeah. Then for a while, I'm in the school, I'm the Great. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, the school, maybe you can help me with something. You know, the other day, my second grade, I asked, he told me that he can't hear 
when people are talking and the other students are talking at the same time. And you can't read when you're driving on the toilet. Well, what you need to do is go to your son's school and make an appointment with the principal there. Share your concerns with him and he can tell you what, what program to take school to help your son. Okay, great. But remember, go to the school office and make an appointment with the principal. Okay, thanks for the information. Good to see you. Take care. Bye bye. In the last scenario, the school security guard followed the correct procedure. He told the parent to go to the office and make an appointment with the principal. The principal will be able to provide assistance and information to the parent. Let's take a look at the next scenario Benjamin's grandmother and the librarian assistant. Good morning, I'm Benjamin's grandmother. I just got my granddaughter off next door and wanted to stop by to see if you could make the information regarding autism. Autism. Hmm. This is an elementary school library. I don't believe in a book on autism, but I can help you research the topic on our internet. Can you have a few minutes? Okay, before we begin, if you don't mind me asking, why are you interested in autism? I really want to share with you how you want to about it. About a week ago, I heard the TDR and we were We were talking about autism. We had a bunch of parents on the TV show talking and describing what the program with special needs were doing. And I watched it and said, they act just like what? Preschool grandson, Ikaika. Does Ikaika offer a new school? He attends young lady preschool, private preschool, although he doesn't come here. I would appreciate any help and information you could provide me. But he has some form of disability. He really care about my grandson. Oh, sure. I don't need to cry. Let's go work on one of the computers in the back of the library and see what we can find in office. Thank you so much for all of your help. I really appreciate it. In the scenario you just saw, the librarian assistant tried to be helpful but she should also refer the grandparent, go to the office and make an appointment with the principal. The principal will be able to provide assistance and information to the parent or guardian. Again, if a parent or guardian tells you about their child having difficulty, always tell them to go to the office and make an appointment with the principal. The principal is the person to provide assistance and information. It is everyone's responsibility to follow the correct referral procedure so that we can ensure that all students receive a free and appropriate education. For more information, go to the DOE Special Education website at doe.k12.hi.us slash special education. Thank you for helping students with special needs get the education they are entitled to receive. Okay. Quality Department of Education security may be replaced from first and third when a child is being abused or has been abused. The Hawaii State Department of Education works collaboratively with the Hawaii State Department of Human Services Child Welfare Services Unit to ensure Hawaii safety are safe and protected. This video explains the process through which suspected child abuse is to be reported and what all employees of the Department of Education must do if they suspect the child to be abused. Hawaii Revised Statutes HRS 350-1 defines child abuse or neglect as the acts or omissions of any person who, or legal entity which, is in any manner or degree related to the child, is residing with the child, or is otherwise responsible for the child's care, that have resulted in the physical or psychological health or welfare of the child, who is under the age of 18, to be harmed or to be subject to any reasonably foreseeable substantial risk of being harmed. The mandatory reporting law 
applies to all members of the Department of Education. Act 16, Session Laws Avoid 2017, relating to reports of child abuse act, was passed by the 2017 state legislature to bring the state into compliance with Public Law 114-22. This act amends the definition of child abuse or neglect to include situations where acts or omission of any person result in sex trafficking or severe forms of trafficking in persons. There is now a separate form and reporting line when reporting suspected human trafficking or sex trafficking. Now we will go over some warning signs that a child is being abused or has been abused. If you suspect a child is in imminent harm, that is harm will occur within the next 90 days, please call the county police, the Child Welfare Services CWS reporting line, and complete the mandatory reporting form. The CWS reporting line and county police should be called immediately if a child discloses abuse or if you notice evidence of the following injuries that are not justifiably explained. Substantial skin bruising and or bleeding, malnutrition, burns, poison, fracture of any bone, swelling, complaint of extreme pain, extreme mental distress, gross degradation, failure to thrive, deprivation of food, clothing, shelter, supervision, psychological, physical, or medical care, and so forth. If the child discloses to you that they are victims of sexual contact or conduct, immediately report the matter to the CWS reporting line and the county police. CWS has the authority to conduct an inquiry with whoever is deemed necessary in order to protect the child. Mandated reporters are required to allow CWS investigators to interview the child without the presence or prior approval of the child's family. If a child discloses to you, or you have other reason to suspect they are being sex trafficked or sexually exploited, there is a separate sex trafficking reporting line and form. Child sex trafficking involves a transaction in which someone of perceived value, such as money, drugs, food, clothing, or shelter, is given for the purpose of engaging in sexual conduct with a minor victim. Commercial sexual exploiters include both the trafficker who advances or profits from the transaction and the sex buyer who is offering something of perceived value to engage in sex with the minor victim. It does not matter whether the victim is engaging in the sex act willingly because a minor cannot consent to being commercially sexual. Sex trafficking is unique and may not look like other forms of sex abuse for several reasons. One, the victim has an existing relationship or bond with their traffic. Two, the victim does not identify as a victim because they believe they are willingly engaging in criminal conduct. And three, their trafficker has trained them to mistrust the system. Although it may be more difficult to identify the victims, research indicates that child victims of sex trafficking experience common risk factors and indicators. It is important to note that not every minor will display these risk factors or indicators. However, evidence suggests that there are certain strong indicators of sex trafficking. If you identify a minor who is displaying risk factors, indicators, or warning signs, please call the Child Welfare Services Human Trafficking Hotline and compute the suspected human trafficking form. In this next section, we will go over victim risk factors and indicators of victims of sex trafficking. All employees of the DOE are encouraged to be vigilant and aware of these risk factors and indicators. Another type of minor who may be vulnerable to being targeted by traffickers are those who are loners or unpopular amongst their peers. Traffickers will identify minors who are wearing old or dirty clothing and use the promise of money or nice things to lure minors into sex trafficking. Minors being victimized through sex trafficking may be forced or choose to wear provocative clothing in varying situations. Youth who are engaged in sex trafficking often defy rules and try to assert their dominance over other targets or victims. They may actively defy boundaries by interrupting and disrupting classes, touching items that are not theirs, and standing too close. Expensive clothing, shoes, phones, and luxury items 
are often used to entice miners to engage in sex trafficking. And therefore, the sudden presence of these types of items should be viewed as an indicator. If you suspect a miner is being sex trafficked, do not question them outright, as it may have an adverse effect, could put them in more danger, and they may have been coached by the trafficker to lie in order to avoid detection. Many will perform trauma bonds with and will lie to protect their traffic. The best practice is to report your suspicion to the DHS hotline. Complete the suspected human trafficking form and allow anti trafficking professionals to conduct an assessment and make the determination. The Susanna Wesley Community Center Trafficking Hotline and Sex Abuse Treatment Center are resources that may be utilized for consultation in situations of suspected sex trafficking or sexual abuse. The Department of Human Services Child Welfare Reporting Line and Human Trafficking Reporting Line are the official mandatory lines that must be called when reporting the suspected abuse. When you make a report to the CWF trafficking line, you will be asked questions regarding the method of how the victims were created, any signs of control or coercion, and indicators of harm. As a reporter, it is helpful to note factual details that lead you to suspect that the victim may be trafficked, including dates and times, names, locations, and descriptions of some of the indicators outlined earlier. Now that you know the law as a mandated reporter, as well as warning signs and indicators of sex trafficking, let's take you through the steps of reporting a student you believe is in danger of any form of abuse. First, complete DHS Form 1516 if the suspected type of abuse is not sex trafficking or human trafficking. Complete DHS Form 1685 if the suspected type of abuse is sex or human trafficking. Next, call DHS Child Welfare Services reporting line to make an oral report. In most cases, you will then call the county police. Immediately notify your school administrator of your call to Child Welfare Services and the police. Fax a completed DHS form to the appropriate fax number within five days of your initial call. Once the form is faxed, Send the original form by mail or DOE courier to DOE Student Support Session. No copy shall remain at school. Should the Child Welfare Services Office inform you that your suspicions do not warrant an investigation, you still must complete and fax the applicable form and notify your school administrator of that call. If you do not have access to the forms and or phone, ask your administrator for assistance. A detailed memo and a link to this video is available on viewing memos and notices. Subject, mandatory reporting of child abuse and neglect. Let's review some important information. Child Welfare Services Reporting Line phone number on Oahu, it's 832-5300. For neighbor islands, call toll-free 1-888-380-3088. Child Welfare Services Reporting Line phone number for sex trafficking and human trafficking. On Oahu, it's 832-1999. For neighbor islands, call toll-free 1-888-398-1188. You'll find the forms DHS-1516 and DHS-1685 on the DHS website or in DOE memos and notices, subject, Mandatory reporting of child abuse and neglect. Mail the original DHS form or send by DOE courier services to the Hawaii State Department of Education, Office of Student Support Services, Student Support Section, 475 22nd Avenue, Honolulu, Hawaii, 96816. For more information, please contact the Hawaii State Department of Education, Student Support Section at 305 9787. Mahalo for your continued commitment to keeping up. Hidoki, let's see, child abuse. Two more videos, fire extinguishers and tsunami, and we're out of here, guys. Fire extinguishers. Let's just do tsunami too.
The purpose of this video is to demonstrate to you the importance of and how to use the virus commonly found in our schools. You will find that this video supports the information currently found in your school's copy of the Department of Education's Business Office Emergency Preparedness. Let's begin with a couple of sobering facts about problems. For the most common problems in war and specific requirements for the use of fire extinguishers in the workplace. For instance, you should know that no fire can provide a full portable fire extinguisher. Fire extinguishers must be secure, maintained, and fire extinguishers must be appropriate for the safety of an anticipated workplace fire. Employees must be trained that they are expected to fully concentrate the fire. Or only the regulations are going to help you, unless you know how to use one of these in case you will fire. So how do you use a fire extinguisher? Well, let's first talk about when to use one. A fire extinguisher is designed to fight a fire in its very early stage of development. This is known as the incipient stage, or an incipient fire. This is not spread beyond the end of the Someone puts it out. Fire can spread very quickly. This demonstrates the fire. The fire spreads from the recipient fire in the first frame all the way to a flashover, which is full involvement of the whole room in just two minutes. Anything past the first picture of this fire is past the capability of you with a fire stick. As an employee of the Department of Education, you are expected to put out an incipient fire only if you are comfortable in doing so. Now, should you decide to put out an incipient fire, you should know something about the extinguishers that you have available. As in most cases, the extinguishers that are available in the schools are of the ABC dry chemical type. ABC refers to Types of classes of fire, the extinguisher can have. Fire is complemented by paper, wood, and plastic. A class C fire is one that involves flammable liquid. A class C fire involves any classes of electrical equipment. In each of these extinguishers is a firefighting power. Unlike the popular jet, it doesn't smother the fire by removing the air. It affects the chemical reaction that makes a fire a fire. This powder is not thought, but it does make quite a mess. But a mess, far less than what an uncontrolled fire can do. Fire extinguishers come with different sizes also. Typically, the most common ink chemical extinguishers range from the two and a half pounds to The truck also mining is low. Both of these extinguishers have the same capacity. The only difference is that my extinguisher has a hole attached to the end. Now, the proper usage of the extinguisher would be as much as possible hold it up at arm's length to keep the greatest distance between you and the fire. This brings up an important point. It's important to use an extinguisher upright like this and not tilted like this. 
The problem lies in the firefighting powder, which lies on the bottom. By tilting the extinguisher, not all the firefighting powder will come out. And you may need every bit of that powder to put out the fire. Okay, Captain Tess, let me see if I got it. You hold it upright, but we'll keep it at arm's length. Now what? Simple. Just remember the word fast. P A N S. P stands for pulling the pin. All fire extinguishers have a pin to prevent against accidental discharge. We simply want to twist the pin and pull to break the tie from the fire extinguisher. A stands for aiming. Aiming at the base of the fire closest to you. The first F is for swinging the first. The second F is for swinging two side to side, back and forth. In the point of the fire closest to you. You may need to advance. So, Miley, there's a fire. Let's see if we can pass. Okay, can you pull the pin? Using a fire extinguisher is the end of the process. The process begins when you discover a fire in the school building. You discover a fire in the school building, pull the fire alarm. This activates a local alarm, which alerts building occupants about the possibility of a fire. This in turn activates fire evacuation plan. Meanwhile, be sure that you send someone to the office Call 911. If you're not confident about using a fire extinguisher, leave the room closing the door behind you. Remember that life safety is first, your life and the life of others. There should be a usable fire extinguisher in every school building. So get trained in this and stay trained. Because all of us, who administrators, teachers, staff, clerks, so the encountering work we're all responsible for the safety of each other, especially our students. Do you know where the nearest fire extinguisher is? I know you all said a resounding yes, but are you sure it's located in an area you can get to easily when you need it? That brings up our next point. Never let a fire get between you and your exit. If the fire extinguisher is on the other side of the fire, away from the exit, forget it. Go to the next closest fire extinguisher. Always, always have a way out. <laughs> okay, so you know where one is. Are you sure it's in proper working order? Fire extinguishers are inspected annually. That is, the Department of Accounting and General Services contracts with a private fire protection company for this. But it's a good idea for us to keep an eye on these extinguishers between inspections. While working in the school, take note of where the fire extinguishers are. When you need one, it's not the time to go hunting for one. Fire extinguishers should never be used as a doorstop, right? A fire extinguisher can be hung on its proper hanger on the wall. As you walk by one, take note to see that it's in good working order. Check to see that the pin is in place. Check if the tie tag is unbroken. And most importantly, check the gate. See if the needle is in the green. If any of these items are not correct, notify your principal of the fact. And he or she will contact the Department of Accounting and General Services, and they will have it corrected. Remember, if you are ever faced with an emergency, like a fire in your room, fire extinguisher and your ability to use it could save your dream, save a life, and maybe, just maybe, save many lives. I'm Mariani. Thank you for watching. Aloha. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, I'm going to All righty, there's the last one. 15 minutes, okay? Hang in there, there we go.
text and put the words directly to your smartphone on Asian Life Info from the Honolulu Department of Emergency Management's website. For Kawhi, sign up for the emergency alert notifications on the county's emergency management website. While Maui, use Maui Emergency Management Agency Makaala Service. For the Big Island, receive emergency notifications by signing up for the Hawaii County Sense website. For our use, the Everbridge app. In addition to notifications from the county, the federal government has arranged with many districts on the area to provide wireless streaming to the birds, known as VIA. If you go to the settings on your phone and a name of the application, you will receive the relevant emergency messages whether you are on Maui, or out of state. The Pacific Tsunami Warning Tsunami Warning System provides advanced warning of the sudden tsunami to get light and calm. Tsunami warning system notifies state and county warning clients as well as county emergency management officers. When the tsunami watch, or the tsunami warning happens, the tsunami watch is a case of advanced warning that actually might be necessary. The options are based purely on scientific information about confirmation that a historic tsunami is not in the way. A tsunami watch will even be upgraded to a tsunami warning for points. In the middle of this, it's a place when a lot of the the public should be watching their TV or listening to the radio for further instructions. The Pacific Tsunami Warning System may be informed of the public in the form of an advisory or no other warning. Sometimes, while there is significant tsunami, you will not have the energy to reply to the tsunami. Instructions will be given to clear the future if you would advise for the new remark that you have to see if the warning goes to the one evacuation is not an emergency. There is an extreme tsunami warning, but actually out of the red and yellow areas and go to the green areas. For the local county, the evacuation team for the historical and extreme event are the same. The key to remember is to evacuate all the route into the location with the new school's emergency evacuation plan. For locally generated tsunamis, schools in the tsunami evacuation zone should act immediately. One, if in a building, drop cover, and foliage to protect yourself from falling debris. Start tense. Two, if shaking is still going on after 20 seconds, evacuate as soon as you can. Evacuate to higher ground immediately to escape potential tsunami waves. Three, activate the emergency response. Four, turn on the radio for emergency alert system broadcasts and official information from emergency management. Five, Inform the complex area superintendent of the emergency condition and evacuation activity. Six, notify parents to retrieve their children at the designated meeting point only after your local emergency management agency informs the public that you have cleared. For schools that are not in the tsunami evacuation zone, they should one, tell on the radio for emergency alert system broadcast and official information from emergency management. Two, 
prepare the remaining place and remain open beyond the school day. Three, plan and prepare the facility to serve as an emergency shelter if ready. Four, notify parents to retrieve their children at the designated meeting point only after your local emergency management agency informs the public that it is clear. When schools become aware of the tsunami watch, they should one, watch TV or listen to the radio to learn if the tsunami watch will be upgraded to a tsunami warning. Two, prepare to turn off utilities. Three, prepare to secure rooms and buildings. Four, notify parents of the school's evacuation procedures and what parents should do to prepare this. Again, a phenomenal watch means a phenomenal may have been generated and is a few three hours from the line. Schools in the tsunami evacuation zone during the tsunami warning do it. One, evacuate following the tsunami evacuation plan. Two, listen to the radio for further information and instructions. Three, inform the complex area superintendent of activities. Four, activate the emergency response team. Five, inform the parents not to attempt to pick up their children. Failure to do this directive will cause confusion, major traffic congestion, prevent emergency vehicles from reaching their destination, and expose people to unnecessary danger. For schools that are not in a tsunami evacuation network, they should one, listen to the radio for further information and instructions. Two, prepare to remain open beyond the school day. Three, inform parents of the following. Stay in place and listen to the radio before instruction. B. Do not attempt to pick up their children. Failure to do this directive will cause confusion, major traffic congestion, prevent emergency vehicles from reaching their destination, and expose people to unnecessary danger. Four. Plan to prepare facilities to serve as an emergency shelter if designated. Any tsunami that has a shoreline runner of one foot or more is in use. That's roughly the thing that was all around the school during the Japan tsunami of March 11, 2011. There were at least two places where the tsunami reached over 15 feet above normal sea level. Noa on Kauai, Revolution on Oahu, and Nakoko on the Rio. A 15 foot rise is an extremely dangerous tsunami. At Kahulu, the water did not reach quite that high, but saw the greatest spray, which is almost a phenomenal thing. By all measures, this is a very dangerous thing. Fortunately, almost everyone in Hawaii took the warning seats. Approximately 70,000 people took the appropriate action to evacuate. Thanks to the widespread public cooperation, orders were called for and no longer In any case, a large portion of the state's population is in school. With the threat of tsunamis, the team to survival is being well prepared. Education, training, and practice every year are vital. I hope this video provides you with key information to prepare your classroom and school and helps in creating your own personal tsunami preparedness plan. Mm -hmm. Okie dokie, guys. Does anyone have any questions about anything that we cover today? Nope. Okay, I'm going to ask if uh, the teachers can go. Those of you who weren't here yesterday, can you stick around for uh, a minute? I want to go over uh, and answer any questions regarding the safety protocols. Uh, for this year um, and then if we have time the custodians you're going to watch some as we could just do them tomorrow okay custodians will do the videos tomorrow so we'll just go over the safety protocols real quick all good thank you for your attention appreciate it